Okay, hey, welcome. Uh, we're going to talk about the uh, soft space cyber triad. I was joking with our uh, my other my other teammates here as part of the triad. I feel like I'm in the back of the shopette giving a Vitamix sale here with people trying to track people in back here. Come on, step right up for the juicer. But uh, hey, great to be here, at AUSA, with again my teammates, uh, General Carbler, General Barrett, uh, talk on such an important topic for all three of our commands. So when the, the three of us last spoke about the uh, cyberspace soft triad, we talk mostly on the triad's value proposition of the joint force. And I want to build on that today and talk about USASOC's value proposition to the triad across the spectrum of conflict and competition, and how USASOC is transforming to meet the Army's requirements of 2030, and how that all ties into the component of the cyberspace soft triad. So our Army's at an inflection point of transformation. The Secretary talked about it yesterday. After 20 years of counterinsurgency and counterterrorism, our Army and the Joint Force is once again focused on strategic competition. When people think of soft, they usually think of the last two decades of counterterrorism in the CENTCOM theater. And to be the truth, the truth is that soft was not built for counterterrorism. We had to transform portions of our force to meet the requirements of the time. So SOF is reinvesting back to our roots of irregular warfare with the added benefit of 20 years of sustained combat operations that will make us even more effective in strategic competition. The strategic environment requires USASOC to transform its force structure, develop and integrate new applications of irregular warfare, and modernize the force for multi-domain operations. Competition for 2030 will leverage new technology across all domains. And during last month's New Warfighter Summit, and yesterday, during the opening of AUSA, Secretary Warmer said the number one thing, the number one thing the Army of 2030 needs to do is to see more, faster, farther, and more persistently at every echelon than our adversaries. The cyberspace soft triad does exactly this by providing the joint force with the enhanced capability to rapidly see, sense, stimulate, strike, assess, and affect across the spectrum, from integrated deterrence during competition to high-end conflict. Now, the word triad, we know it, it, in military sense, it's, it's commonly associated with strategic deterrence or the nuclear triad. Now, this modern-day triad is not meant to replace but actually enhance integrated deterrence by providing perhaps more politically palatable and acceptable options in terms of risk for our policymakers and is our professional responsibility to provide our best military advice to policymakers that would contribute to deterrence, perhaps in a different way. Cyberspace and soft all possess, each one of us possess unique, unique but independent capabilities. Each component can rapidly gain intelligence, attack critical vulnerabilities, and we must leverage all of these components in order to impose doubt, cost, and belief upon our adversaries. USASOC's value proposition as a component of this triad is our people, our forward presence, our international partnerships, our innovative mindset, and our ability to converge capabilities for asymmetric advantages. SOF brings outsized impact across, uh, thanks to our access, presence, influence, to create enduring advantages in this operational environment. The Army's new field manual, 3.0 of multi-domain operations, defines the operation environment with three dimensions, physical, informational, and human, as well as five physical domains, air, ground, space, cyberspace, and maritime. SOF inherently influences across the human and informational dimensions to achieve placement and access in the physical dimension. This allows the triad to converge capabilities across all three dimensions and enable the joint force to better see, sense, and strike across all five domains. We do this across the spectrum of competition, crisis, and conflict. So for competition, steady state competition, SOF operates as a component of the triad through its physical placement, access, and sustained presence in politically sensitive, sometimes hostile, and sometimes contested areas. Our special forces, civil affairs, psychological operations, and intelligence units are forward postured, engaging and influencing relevant populations in the contact layer every day. Our access and influence in these areas allow the triad to conduct pre-conflict operational preparation of the environment, target analysis, 
as well as location-specific testing, emplacement, and employment of space and cyber-enabling capabilities for the Joint Force. We do this through irregular warfare campaigning, and USASOC currently has and always has approximately 2,800 to 3,000 people spread across 77, about 80 different countries around the world every day. Moving on to crisis, irregular warfare campaigning allows the triad to deliver on effective and scalable deterrence options during crisis in both first strike and retaliatory scenarios. Our forward posture and deep relationships allow us to enable early action to deter, disrupt, or surprise adversary anti-axis denial capabilities and C5 ISRT. A great example, I'll, I'll give a quick vignette on you know, Ukraine. A lot's been written about persistence presence of UK in the last seven and a half years prior to the invasion after Crimea and then this current invasion where uh, SOF was a, a small part, small part along with the National Guard and other parts of the uh, army at helping training and transform Ukrainian SOF and military from a Russian influenced Spetsnaz type model an organization to a NATO compatible professional and lethal fighting force. Our current irregular warfare contributions are providing effective, are proving effective on Ukraine's battlefield today. Army Soft's forward and CONUS-based intelligence support is helping Ukrainian resistance see more, faster, and more persistently than their Russian adversaries at echelon, and it gets better every day. USASOC is leveraging CONUS-based industry and R&D to help Ukrainian soft counter Russian tactics. Our recent counter UAS train advise and assist support is enabling Ukrainian forces to innovate at the speed of war. We are seeing them employ asymmetric capabilities that rapidly detect, fix, and jam Russian UAS systems, severely degrading Russia's reconnaissance strike capability in Ukraine. In the information space, our psychological operations soldiers are enabling Ukrainian counterparts with messaging to bolster Ukrainian resilience and resistance through national branding and recruiting. Civil affairs are assisting Ukrainian soft, mapping resistance volunteer forces, facilitating cross-border delivery of humanitarian supplies by coordinating with non-governmental organizations. When we look at the utility of the triad in support of a partner force in civilian resistance like Ukraine, the possibilities are truly endless. Cyber and space capabilities can set conditions with a partner force and relevant populations for special operations during crisis and posture for future combat operations. During conflict, as a component of the triad, SOF supports the Army Joint Force conflict, providing tactical, operational, strategic advantage through multi-domain operations. This is done by converging the triad capabilities to deliver effects that each component simply cannot deliver and achieve on their own. SOF's contribution to this convergence is through irregular, war for, irregular warfare core tasks which include, but are not limited to, forward internal defense, unconventional warfare, direct action, civil affairs operations, psychological operations, and special reconnaissance. I'll give you another direct action conceptual example. 75th Ranger Regiment, you just saw them win the best squad in the Army here yesterday, one, one team from Charlie Company 175. But for the 75th Ranger Regiment, uh, and the, is the Army's only joint force capable of conducting a no-notice joint force entry operation, accomplishing the mission and departing the objective in one period of darkness. Could be enabled by our Special Operations Aviation Regiment, and we validate this task with the joint force every three and a half months. In this instance, triad capabilities could enable relative overmatch for Ranger Lodgement Force or a key terrain raid. Triad conus based operational support could enable real-time targeting and form the Ranger Force at the initial staging base, integrating, integrating space and cyber capabilities during the JFE, the Joint Force Entry, or key terrain raid, enables an MDO capable range of force to penetrate and disintegrate complex peer adversary C5 ISRT systems at scale. Transforming, USASOC, we're transforming today, just like the whole Army is. But for us, people are our platform, and our force design efforts in USASOC 2030 will seek best to converge triad effects and employ our high-end capabilities across the spectrum of competition, crisis, and conflict. At the two-star headquarters level, 1st Special Forces Command is moving out on a regular warfare transforming or campaigning headquarters to converge transregional campaigning activities on our NDS threats. 1st Special Forces Command is also experimenting on a deployable two-star Special Operations Joint Task Force headquarters 
to better interoperate with the joint force during high-end conflict, with their first joint exercise occurring this next summer during Pacific Century 23 in Indo-PACOM Theater. This will allow SOFT to employ capabilities and converge triad effects in concert with the Army's multi-domain task force. It is here where a SIGITF and an MDTF could work in concert with the triad using organic cyberspace and long-range sensing capabilities to generate effects and broader support to the joint force. Conversely, a SIGITF's convergence of the triad capabilities could provide relevant targeting data to the MDTF during crisis or escalation and conflict. At the brigade and battalion headquarters level, we are experimenting with realigning our SOF to leverage the full capability of Special Forces, Civil Affairs, PSYOPs, Army Special Operations, Aviations, cross-functional teams. We are also experimenting with the size of our units of action to better support this approach. At the individual level, we're seeking methods to develop a technology integrator and a technology innovator specialty MOS to best employ robotics, unmanned systems, coding, artificial intelligence, and electronic warfare. Experimenting with the creation of a warrant officer population to embed these capabilities within our units of action. All three of our commands are moving forward on institutionalizing this triad through a series of experiments, exercises, and engagements in the contact layer. Army Campaign Plan 2030 calls for the Army to deliver an MDO capable force that enables a joint force to penetrate in complex peer adversary defense systems. USASOC, as a component of this triad, enables this through a regular warfare value proposition. So I'll get ready to hand it over to our other two uh, teammates here. I look forward to your questions, but I want to leave you this. Our adversaries are engaging us right now in the, in the digital, the informational, and the technological spaces now. There's no sanctuary here, there's no sanctuary at home, and there's no sanctuary at abroad. We must modernize to adapt and prepare for high-end conflict while also competing now left a crisis where the opportunities, in my opinion, are the greatest. Tomorrow is too late. Today is the day. I look forward to your questions. Sine Perry. So yesterday when I was talking to somebody, they came up to me and they said, I want to know more about this influence triad, and I immediately shot them down, not literally. This is not just about influence. This is about full spectrum. You heard the secretary yesterday talk about active campaigning. We want to disrupt adversary actions. We want to demonstrate resolve. We want to shape the adversary's perceptions, and then we want to gain an advantage for the warfighter when deterrence fails. This is what we're doing. And we're not doing it just for us. We're combining our capabilities in, in order to support a joint force commander, because that's what it's all about. We realize we exist in three functional commands with the different capabilities, different authorities, how can we downstream where we're at, where we live today, where we're in touch with the adversary today, and combine those effects and deliver them without having to go upstream to the functional commands over to the GCCs and then back down to deliver those effects. How Army Cyber fits into that is we deliver five mission threads. Operate and defend our networks, attack and influence, and then across those four, inform commanders what the battle space looks like. How well are your networks responding? What does the attack surface look like? What does the influence sphere look like? What are the trends that the adversary is doing in that information sphere? And so on and so forth. What I really think Army Cyber delivers are some comparative advantages in a few key areas that I'd like to highlight. First of all, there is a track record of integrating cyber, EW, and influence operations. We've done it before. And so now we can deliver this to my partners over here, having the reps and sets of doing that. We also can project this from Fortitude Hall at Fort Gordon, or 
We can do it in an expeditionary manner with our expeditionary cyber teams or our IO teams forward deployed, paired up in support of my partners here. We also provide a mature cloud-based big data analytics platform and the capability to develop tools and applications to enhance those missions and give insights to my partners here. And then lastly, um, uh, we would, in terms of the influence area, with that big data platform, we can sense, synthesize, and give understanding to a commander about what the influence environment looks like, especially misinformation and disinformation. What are those indicators and trends that need, we need to be aware of that influence the commander's decision making? You've heard about combined arms. You're going to hear that drum beat a lot here. General Bragg already mentioned it. We know this from experience. I'll tell you five years ago when we started looking at how to apply cyber against the counter ISIS fight, we started out with discrete cyber attacks. Then we paired our cyber attacks with the schema maneuver by the warfighting commander, and the results were greater than the sum of those two things. This is not, we've all seen this over and over again in history. And then when we started layering an influence to amplify those effects, it was even greater. So this is what this is. Let's now take what our cyber does from an integrated standpoint. What we know is better with the warfighter. Let's take these unique capabilities and authorities and the intelligence that we do within our unique space and combine those to deliver those to the Joint Force Commander. And now I'll turn it over to my, the last but not least partner, Dan Carbler. Well, good morning. There's always a danger when I have a microphone up here that I'm going to break into karaoke, but I'll spare everybody that this morning. Hey, remember a few years ago, the commercial that was on about pork, and they would talk about pork, it's the other white meat. Remember that? Well, in multi-domain operations, space, it's the other domain. And we have to remember that very well because just as we have land, air, sea, and cyber, space is just as equal in its importance to the war fight as all of our other domains. What I want to do here before we take Q&A is I'm just going to, I'm going to take it from the, from the big and then, then down to a little bit more granular level. And, and I'm going to take just not issue with Maria, but she talked about functional commands. I used to work for a guy named General John Hyten when he was the STRATCOM commander, and he hated being referred to as a functional combat commander as he had more yield in his right hand than anybody else. And so he always taught us that he, he was truly a global combat command. And so I would tell you that the beauty of the, my uh, two partners here and with SNBC is we are global commands. We work for, we're natural integrators. We work for, mul we support multiple combatant commands and we work across multiple domains. And I think that's important because we're all natural integrators here. So the triad, when you talk about the, the, you know, this kind of a new idea. It is not a new idea. This is simply taking what our capabilities are and applying it in a com combined arms model. Think about FM 3.0 right now is about combined arms. Space, cyber, and soft capabilities in combined arms are no different than bringing together maneuver, fires, aviation, smoke, all the other normal battlefield effectors that you would expect to help accomplish the objective. Now within Army space particularly, what I want to talk about a little bit is now, how are we supporting the triad? And, and, and the, the beauty is I get to support US STRATCOM, US SPACECOM, and US NORTHCOM. Mainly here I'm going to focus on US Space Command. I have First Space Brigade, which provides capabilities to General Dickinson as, uh, in his combatant commander role. 
But as Army space continues to develop, we're supporting the multi-domain task forces with our space control companies. We have space control planning teams at each of the Army Service Component Commands, Corps, and Divisions. Army space support teams providing planning capabilities to those ASCCs and Corps. And the space control companies support the multi-domain task forces. And as we move into the future, we will bring space capabilities up to the theater level and support theater army commanders with theater level space capabilities. The Theater Strike Effects Group, the TSEG, will provide that theater level space control capabilities. And when then integrated with soft and cyber, whether that's the accesses that each of those commanders can provide us, whether it's space capabilities that I'm going to provide them, it's going to have a deterrent effect on the adversary, and it will provide non-lethal effects to our adversaries. Within, and then when we talk about active campaigning, we look at what we are also able to provide on Intel support to space, provide that information Again, whether it's to SOF or whether it's to cyber or that supported, uh, the supported commander. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, what I would like to do is bring up my, uh, my uh, partners here. We will form a triangle, so we will have a nice triad right here, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you. All right, you might have to do the karaoke now, Dan. <laughs> Good morning, gentlemen, ma'am. Um, can you provide some um, recent examples of where you have been able to work together um, where the sum of your parts is greater um, than the whole? Well, I double tap first on what Maria said there before and the uh, really the destruction of the ISIS caliphate was a combination of both stuff that was done in the physical as well as the cyber uh, domains and, and dimensions there as well as combined. So we combined lethal and non-lethal effects for a much, much more holistic effect uh, that provided uh, gains on the ground in the physical domain, but it also provided gains in the information domain that uh, both Cyber Command was able to do with non-lethal means, and then there were some kinetic means that were put into effect for uh, exponentially more impact, uh, and it and actually had an, a larger impact than any of us actually expected and predicted uh, before we went down that journey together. That's really informed a lot of my thinking going forward. Um, you know, before it might have, you know, Cyber might have thought to a lot of people as some strategic intel and indicators and warnings and just providing access for indication warning, but combining with actions to the maneuver force on the ground, I think this really was groundbreaking for, uh, for, for, for leading a lot of different thoughts for uh, how the maneuver force could actually employ this in combined arms maneuver. In a, in a very kinetic fight, but combining those two together, I think it shaped a lot of thought moving forward. There are the things we're doing together right now. We, we won't go into those details in this setting. Um, so not only is it in the contact layer of things we're working together now, but conceptually we work together, whether it's contributing towards project convergence, uh, you know, experimentation, um, but we're, we're, we're doing it both in, again, experiments, exercises, and activities across the globe right now. Yeah, I think the only two things I would add to that is um, positionally, my partners here exist in two very different spaces, literally and figuratively. Um, and then forward. Um, there are some places that they go that maybe I can't get to. And so this is where I would say, hey, can you get me close to something so that I can do X, Y, and Z? The other thing that I'll do, and again, going back to what would I deliver to them, uh, so they offer me a positional advantage, uh, and then can I let them see the environment 
in a way that perhaps they were not able to do, or if they're downrange and the special operator perhaps doesn't have the time to take a look at all the data that we're seeing, can I offer him something very fast um, and very informative to his team's decision making that might inform their operations? Hey, Paul, if I could too. So I just want you to, uh, a for instance here. So I'm gonna put on my air missile defense hat since I have space and missile defense. And I just want you to think about our strategic documents that we have that talk about missile defeat and left of launch. So in my missile defense realm, I'm very interested in any kind of left of launch missile defeat capabilities. And I put on my space hat and I'm a pretty good left of launch person. And right here I got two very good left of launch missile defeat partners here. Hi, sir, ma'am. Um, I'm Nick Chadwick from NT Concepts. Um, wh when I was in USA Soccer, USA k -POC, we had something called radio in a box. And I applaud you for mentioning information operations and the integration be because they have that capability at USA Soccer in the different POGs and uh, information warfare command. What I'd like to ask you, sir, is have you considered doing machine learning on the TechLand or integrating those requirements in the TechLand program? Uh, we're looking at integrating machine learning and AI and basically everything we do as, as data exponentially gets more and more uh, enormous and complex. I mean, that, that is really a subcomponent of the Army's information advantage efforts, which can you make sense of the senseless of the ever-growing amount of data for a commander to make mission command type decisions? But also, when you go back to a regular warfare and influencing relevant populations, going back to your background, be it civil affairs or psyops, actually Cyber Command and, and, uh, and USASOC, our cyber and USASOC has had a partnership for a long time where people are focused more on the human cognitive uh, domain and, and content side, has been, ver has been very complimentary and actually worked for our cyber for the delivery mechanism side. And that's been a partnership going on for quite a long time now. Um, What's new now is as we focus more on, uh, you know, the NDS priorities. That's a that's a growth industry of where we can go with that. Machine learning, I look at as as critical moving forward, uh, for down to the tactical level. To be honest with you, which is why we're exploring with different uh, skill specialties at the tactical level. And we look at the future as, as soft's, uh, you know, need for forward edge computing for understanding some of that data and tapping back into it in the cloud. And how do we get that forward in a safe manner through LPI and LPD comms where a, a soft operator might be contributing towards a, uh, it could be part of a special reconnaissance firing solution, you know, Link 16 back up to JADC2, that would be absolutely critical uh, to be processed through machine learning and, and, and algorithms that we're working on. Yeah, and within, when you're doing operational preparation of the environment and you take all the reams of data in that my G2 is taking, taking we, we can't filter through all of that. And then when we're able to, to cache that and then being able to share it with the triad partners here, uh, that, that makes us all that much more powerful, effective, and then responsive to the combatant commander. Hi, good morning. Davis Winky, Army Times. Uh, I was really struck by the description of this triad as a new combat arms model, one perhaps that happens a little more to the left of armed conflict. How does packaging it as a modern combined arms help your combatant commanders who are overwhelmingly maneuver officers understand what the three of you bring to the table? Thank you. Well, whether it's functional, global, strategic, but there's a lot of special, uh, unique capabilities that reside in each one of the legs of this triad. I think anything going to a, a geographic combatant commander, if three of these entities approach with a holistic solution that's going to contribute to their campaign plan is going to be welcome and it has been welcome to the GCCs that I have personally interacted with. Vice, three individual approaches, hey, I got the best special operation idea in the world. I have no idea what space or cyber are doing, but I know what SOF is doing. That, that's, that's just one more customer for them to synthesize. So us coming together, having already experimented this and presenting a holistic con op that supports their campaign plan and, and most importantly, General Carb is talking about, we're inherently global. So while geographic combatant commands have geographical problems, the, the NDS priorities are global and transregional by nature, which we actually provide an outsized effect coming to the geographic combatant command 
with concepts and con ops that are already uh, uh, synchronized, hopefully, trans-regionally. And it's, and it's practiced in the Tier 1 exercises. I mean, between General Nakasone and then General Clark and General Dickinson, it is practice. This isn't, it, it's not new. The, the, what we're doing as a combined arms, we're just, we're just making sure that we're uh, staying synchronized and maybe formalizing a little bit better. But it isn't anything new that, we've been, that we haven't been doing in uh, our different Tier 1 yeah. exercises. I, I want to hit on the GCC part. I, I think the last time I was in a forum talking about this, I asked the audience, raise your hand if somebody came to you and said, I have a really great idea to take three capabilities into a con op and integrate them, but you have to do all the work. What, how would that be received? And you're right, they're busy. And so I, I think this is, if we can, this is the downstream piece. At the Army level, can we deliver something into them that is already there and, 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 and that's much better? Okay, thanks everybody. I, it looks like we ran out of time. We got the flashcard hook there. Uh, <laughs> but hopefully, uh, you know, we, we help paint the picture a little bit of what, what we're looking at is very uh, important today's uh, challenges that, uh, across uh, you know, for the United States and our national security, and hopefully uh, we answer some of your questions. But thanks, everybody. Appreciate your time.